putting for a section. So uh, Joel Lehman is uh, one of the research scientists at, at Carper working on open-endedness and evolutionary algorithms. Uh, and in order to motivate this direction, uh, we, we decided to do a very uh, broad overview of the topic and why people should be interested in open-endedness. Uh, Joel, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, thanks for the intro, Louis. Um, so it's nice to be here. And so we talk on promise, progress, and challenges in open-ended search. Um, so just like a brief intro to me, um, I've been doing this open-ended stuff for, for some time, since, since 2008, and I started working with neural networks as a PhD student then with like 10, 20 neurons. Um, so it's kind of funny to look back. And over time, I transitioned from academia to industrial research. So I was at um, Uber AI Labs and OpenAI and you now Carper. Um, oops. And I guess neural networks are a little bit bigger now. Um, so the work I'll be presenting today is uh, Mary standing right in the middle of them while holding this letter in her hand. You can see she's also wearing her father. Okay, um, <laughs> so the work I'll be presenting today is, is done with these core collaborators, uh, Jeff Kloon, Ken Stanley, Ray Wang, and I'll be presenting a pretty opinionated take on open-endedness research. I just wanna point out that there's a lot of other research groups would have their own views, and I'm not gonna cover all the research that's that's out there, um, but that certainly this is a growing field and uh, a lot of people are doing great work in this area. So the outline of the talk is kind of a talk in three parts. First, to kind of motivate, what is open-endedness? Why should we care about it? been talking about what progress in this field looks like to me, kind of the building blocks of open-endedness and then concluding with some open challenges. So first, what is the promise of open-endedness? What is this, is, what is this all about? Um, and to begin with, we can just try to, to talk about what do I even mean by open-endedness? This is kind of this vague term that I keep throwing around. And I'll try to explore what this is by pointing at processes we're familiar with and the, in the, the world around us that embody this, that have inspired this field. So one being biological evolution. And I think sometimes it's, it's kind of hard to overstate how amazing the process of biological evolution is. It's this volitionless process, as far as we know, that that started with a single cell and has diversified into the complexity that we see of things in the world around us. And it's really mind boggling that such a process can exist that produced us, for example, that we are composed of quadrillions of little uh, autonomous robots uh, called cells that somehow culminate in the experience that you're having right now, phenomenological experience of, of watching me and listening to me and making sense of the words that I'm saying. And this all came from this process of, of biological evolution and all this potential was latent in that first self-replicating cell, whatever it was, that could reach this, this grandeur and it keeps going. It's been going for billions of years and continues to go. And it's kind of a, a really incredible search process, a search process that starts from something relatively simple and continually innovates and creates and fills all the niches of life around us, plants, animals, um, our own brain, um, it's, uh, the more I think about it, I still am kind of awed, awed by it. So that would be kind of a canonical example of an open-ended search process that's inspired this field. Um, but also we can look at processes of, of cultural open-endedness that on some potentially apocryphal day, man discovered fire. And from that beginning of discovery, we to this day have discovered many, many, many different scientific innovations. And science itself keeps accelerating, discovering new technologies, and there's seemingly no end to this. And so we can also view the process of, of human invention or innovation as a kind of open-ended process. And we can try to boil this down to something like search that continually accumulates and creates impressive new things. And One way I like to think about this is through this cryptic analogy problem that this is, I'm trying to capture in this slide kind of my take on what I think the ambition of open-endedness is. What, what 
this field could get to. And on the left, we have this bird is to jet, and the right we have is evolution is to open openness. And the idea here is that at some point we were inspired by the flight of birds. We were inspired by, by seeing flight, and maybe at some point we tried to mimic it directly. We tried to create ornithopters, machines that were sort of like birds. And maybe that got us to some, some mild success. But what really set off our ability to engineer flying machines was when we abstracted the high level principles behind flight itself. We inspired by nature, but then we discovered that the, these high level principles that could be embodied in many different ways. So once we have understood those principles of flight, we could create things like helicopters, like jets, things that transcend the potential of biology. Um, we can take, uh, a, a jet can take cargo across uh, across the, the ocean spanning continents, carrying a mounted cargo that a bird never could. And so can we do something similar when it comes to processes like evolution? That although we understand how biological evolution, evolution works in some sense, we have yet to abstract the key creative principles that would allow us to embody the prolific creativity of, of, of evolution in many different forms. And so in my mind, you know, what would, what would be the jet of, of evolution that we could put in different domains and actually um, have that kind of creativity in a bottle. And it's an interesting and profound mystery and, and I don't think we've quite achieved that, but that's, that would be kind of like a, a North star for where the, the field maybe could go. So taking down from these kind of aspirational heights, could we talk about what actually an algorithm like this might look like? Uh, so I'll kind of, uh, and one way to start there is to contrast a kind of open-ended machine learning algorithm with one that maybe is more familiar within machine within um, within machine learning. So we could contrast it with like supervised machine learning. Oops. So in supervised machine learning, um, you'd have a data set like this is images taken from ImageNet, and you would have some kind of neural architecture. This is the, the famous AlexNet um, architecture. And then you would try to fit the, uh, the model to the data. And so you would have a kind of a training curve like this um, where over epochs of training, you converge to the model fitting the data as well as it can. And this would translate to unsupervised learning for things like you know, language models like GPT and so on. Um, at some point, there's no point in running the algorithm anymore. You've converged. There's nothing more um, that you can learn from the data. And so this search process would just necessarily stop. This would not be an algorithm worth running for a billion years. Um, and we could take, contrast that to like something that's a little more open-ended. I'm not saying this is a complete solution to open-endedness, but there's an algorithm called Poet that I worked on a few years back. And it had a search space, search space that encompassed not only um, solutions, like a neural network that would solve a particular problem, but also would try to invent problems itself. So in other words, it's a little bit more like machine learning research community than just the, an application of machine learning to a particular problem. So the algorithm is inventing its own challenge benchmarks in a way abstractly, you know, loosely, kind of like how the machine learning community would invent new benchmarks for itself. The idea here is that we could have an algorithm that would accumulate a collection of potentially increasingly com complex problems and their solutions. So in this case, it's just in the simple domain of um, problems being different landscapes that a reinforcement learning agent um, controlled by a neural network could learn to traverse. So it's, it's not anywhere near the grandiosity of evolution, but this is an algorithm that's worth at least running for some time. After, after it solves a problem, it can invent a new problem for itself to challenge it. Um, okay, so that's kind of, uh, kind of a, a brief example of kind of trying to ground out a little bit about what we mean by openness. And then the question is, you know, why, do, why would we want something like this? And one way to answer this question would be to talk about um, why we have, have spaces like basic research or academia, where there's some allowance um, for, for blue sky research, something that isn't exactly pointed towards something in particular. And the reason we, we recognize the desire, or sorry, the need for these things is that we understand that we need places, sometimes when we want to get to really ambitious um, goals, it's better to just try to discover what, the things you can discover locally. Um, in other words, if you were born 
in the, in the, in the time of the technology of the abacus and you have the aspiration to someday reach a laptop, then what you should not do is just focus narrowly on trying to get to the laptop because what you would actually need to get there are all these intermediate technological stepping stones that have nothing to do in, from the super, superficial view uh, uh, with a laptop. So for example, the idea of, of a transistor, which might be a key stepping stone, a path from, from an abacus to a laptop, it's just not, it's not obvious if you're coming from this other point of view that you would need that. And so what you should do is just basic science. You'd actually have to kind of understand uh, principles of electricity and the kinds of, of really fundamental scientific stepping stones that would eventually get you there. And similarly, when we might embody an open-ended search process in, in, in a computer, if our objective is to get someplace really ambitious, like say AGI or something like that, then we might also need a, a, a search algorithm that's going to be exploring in a very broad way, um, just as we do in the machine learning community itself. Um, so scientifically, there's this interesting question that I think is profound about what is the nature of algorithmic creativity, just from a pure kind of knowledge, knowledge kind of um, point of view, like how, how, what actually are these things? Like, it's just a, a really interesting, profound philosophical question. Like, what are the high level principles behind this? Then we can think about practically, where would we, where would this kind of algorithm be useful? Um, and you can think of things like architecture search for neural networks, for example, as kind of an interesting place where an open-ended search algorithm would be useful because there is an open-ended search that machine learning researchers are currently doing to find new neural architectures. When we talk about people discovering transformers or confidence, um, it's not that they were directly, it's not that you can just set that as a target and find it. You need to explore broadly the space. And sometimes the, the potential of these architectures aren't even obvious when they start. So confidence were around for quite a bit before people actually recognized like, oh, wow, this is gonna be really, really useful for us in a lot of applications. Um, you can imagine using open-ended search to automatically create training data for neural networks. And this might seem a little not, not obvious at first, but the idea is that what originally created the training data that we're using for neural networks um, is the, the, the product of an open-ended system, us. We, we created all the, the images that go into stable diffusion. We created all of the, the text, text that goes into um, something like GPT. And so if we were able to have an open-ended system uh, within that, that's, um, if we're able to have an AI that, that itself is embodying an open-ended system, then it too could generate useful training data this way. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in general, just the, the idea of automated creativity or automated design with some ambitious um, goal at the end of just automating science, that, that science is an open-ended process. There, there may not be anything particularly magical about science. There may be no reason it could not be um, tackled in an algorithmic way if we could figure out how to decompose it. And in particular, you could kind of look at a proposal from uh, Jeff Kloon from a, a couple years back on something called AIGAs, AI generating algorithms. And his claim is that there's you know, another way to, to approach trying to create really powerful AI systems. One way is to, for humans to try to figure out all the building blocks like transformers and batch norm and how to combine them together. And another approach would be to to actually have a search algorithm that's looking through those building blocks, assembling them together itself and in a way more akin to, to biological evolution than to um, a directed human-centric human kind of process. Okay, so that was talking about what, what open-endedness is, maybe why it's interesting, why we could get excited about it, why it's a little bit different than, than um, some of the paradigms of machine learning we are more familiar with. And next I'll give an opinionated take on what I think progress in this field has looked like. And to me, it looks like accumulating a richer algorithmic toolbox for, uh, for engineering creative search processes. So a lot of different building blocks you can combine together in different ways to, to get to more places. Um, and so I'll talk about what I think are some of the key building blocks um, that we've discovered so far. So um, these include things like diversity seeking, serendipity, local competition, the evolution of problems and solutions, and the idea of minimal, minimal criteria. 
Um, so diversity seeking, for example, the idea that we can have search algorithms that centrally are driven towards diversity, which is a little bit in contrast to, to, to um, algorithms that, that are kind of narrowing in, that are optimizing. And a hallmark of biological evolution and creative search process in general is that they are highly divergent, that you might discover something that leads to a new field of research and that will kind of branch off and the tree of life has so many branches. Um, so there's something about these processes that they that diversity is kind of a, a fundamental part of it. Um, the idea of, of local competition, that sometimes we need to nurture um, the potential of a new discovery before we let it compete with everything else. So for example, in, in basic research, we even though we think transformers are really powerful architecture or that deep learning is a really powerful um, approach, still there's some resources given to other, other approaches that maybe aren't as dominant right now. And the idea is there, we don't know where this is all leading. And so we should, we should actually prote protect innovation and allow it some chance to, to mature in its own right before it might have to compete more broadly with everything else. And can we put that ingredient into, a, into, a, into an algorithm? Um, this problem solution co-evolution that can we actually have algorithms that will invent their own challenges? Um, and the concept of minimal criteria, which is a way of thinking about constraints in search, that when, we are, when we're searching for something, we can, we can really get narrow and kind of optimize towards something. Or another way of doing it is, is setting a floor, saying that we're interested in anything as long as it meets this kind of constraint. So for example, in biological evolution, as long as you survive and reproduce, that is the kind of the, the, the floor that allows you your, your genes to persist into the future. And so it's a different way of looking about search, um, a floor rather than kind of a narrow focus. And I'll dive now into these, these pieces in more detail just to give you an idea of how we could embody these algorithmically. Um, I'll, talk, I'll talk about these mostly in an evolutionary setting and then I'll highlight how this can be can translated into the deep learning world. But it's kind of like, a, these are kind of the, you can say the basis functions that people have discovered in this field of research that can enable creating lots of different kinds of open-ended um, algorithms. So what I'll do is walk through a series of algorithms. Um, I'll, I'll give the most detail to this first one, novelty search, just to give us some um, solid footing on, on one particular algorithm. And these algorithms are different ways of, of looking at biological evolution and abstracting it into an algorithm that will, um, instantiate some of these building blocks in different ways. So we'll start first with, with novelty search, which is uh, basically just a simple algorithm that is entirely focused on, on generating diversity. So one way to introduce novelty search is to talk about the foil against which it um, contrasts with, which is the paradigm of, of black box optimization. So if we learn about an evolutionary algorithm in, in like a typical um, machine learning course, they're introduced as these black box optimizers that they're just trying to optimize towards some fitness function. And that's one way of looking at evolution. We can abstract evolution as survival of the fittest. And so if we were talking about a typical black box optimization algorithm and applying it to, let's say a particular problem, like here I'll use this running example of of a, a neural network that will create a policy that will control a robot in a simulator uh, with some objective, like to get to a goal within, within a maze. So if we were applying this black box optimization approach, we're basically asking the algorithm to give me the best performing parameters, search for the best performing parameters. And so the, the parameter space here would be a, the, the space of neural network weights. And the way that we would evaluate how good a, a set of weights were was that we would, um, take those weights and connect it to uh, a simulator. So you know, let's say we have a robot simulator. And at the end of the robot's evaluation in a maze, let's say we, we get some objective function, like it's distance to a goal and we give it its score. Um, and so then we could just say, let's look through the space of neural network weights to try to get to the highest score, the, the, the one that's closest to the, the goal we care about. And so the, the change in novelty search would be, let's abstract evolution in just a different way. There's lots of ways we can look at biological evolution, lots of ways we could create algorithms. 
And one thing we could do is say, what's a hallmark of biological evolution but beyond survival of the fittest? Well, another way of, of looking at biological evolution is just that it creates a lot of diversity. That seems to be a hallmark of, of the evolutionary process. And if we focused in that facet, instead, we could say, let's just create an algorithm that all it's trying to do is to, is to discover novelty. All it's trying to do is to reward things that are different than what have appeared in the past. Now, evolution isn't, isn't explicitly trying to do that, but we can, we can take the, um, the liberty of doing whatever we want, and we can embody that principle if we think it's an important principle algorithmically in a direct way. And so we can create a search algorithm that is just measuring novelty and trying to accentuate it. So we could, if we took this lens, we could say, instead of searching for the best set of parameters, we can ask the algorithm, return me a set of solutions that, that spans a, sp a space of behaviors that I define. So instead of a giving a, fi a fitness function saying, what is the, the, the measure of performance here? I'll say, what is the way, what is the space of behaviors that I'm interested in? And just give me kind of solutions that do everything within that space. So here, again, we'd, we'd be, to be searching through the space of neural network weights using this robotic simulator again, where we have the neural network that's controlling a robot. But at the end, what we're, we're looking at is not the objective function, but some characterization of its, of its behavior where the robot ends up in a maze. Uh, I have a quick question. Oh, sure. I don't know if you can hear me. So I can. Uh, just a, like a naive question. If we're optimizing, okay, so if we want a set of solutions with diverse behavior, uh, like one simple baseline might just be parameterize your behavior with some, like randomly initialize your weights, right? So if you take a set of like 10 randomly initialized neural networks, uh, I guess perhaps this would have like pretty diverse behavior. So I'm wondering like, uh, how, uh, from your perspective is how, how hard does it do better than the random baseline? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, yeah, it gets to the heart of exploration. Like what is exploration about? And one way you could explore within a space of say neural network weights, just, just random random search, just yeah, pick um, 10 or 20 or whatever, just random settings and evaluate them and see how they do. Um, and so it turns out that, that in a lot of domains, the space of, of neural network weights, for example, is really um, a rocky challenging space in that just as if you were to randomly initialize my brain, you know, like a, a million times, it's unlikely that you're going to get some kind of functional human behavior out of it because there's some nuance to that space. Mm -hmm. And so it, it does turn out that following the gradients of, of novelty is a really advantageous thing to do. So okay. actually, if I, if I measure this thing, did something different, then that could be a stepping stone to something even diff more different. And that, that turns to do much, much better than, than a random baseline. So randomly initializing weights does not really actually produce a, like set of highly novel behaviors. Yeah, it, it might in the beginning, you might be able to, you know, seed search for that way. Like, so like um, in the domain I'll be talking about, like there's like a robot or something. And it could be that initial random weights would maybe, it, like it'll turn in a circle or maybe it'll, it'll kind of like just drive forward. So there'll be like mm -hmm. a set of kind of really basic behaviors that you can discover that way, but there's nuance in how you would build upon those behaviors. And at some point the random baseline just kind of falls apart. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, right, so, so actually this, this algorithm, if you want to turn it into an algorithm, actually can be quite simple. And you can just take, for example, um, an evolutionary algorithm and, and change the fitness function from measuring performance to the goal to something like um, the, the average, average distance to the k nearest neighbors in some behavior space. So if you have a way to, um, so that'd be, that'd be some measure of how novel a new individual is from things you've seen in the past. You have a way to map individuals into a, a space of behaviors and you can just measure within that space. And the idea is that by directly incentivizing divergence in some space, um, the, the population will spread out and eventually you'll kind of, you'll, you'll cover it. Um, and so just this example that we use in the paper, which is more kind of a philosophical thought experiment than, than a um, you know, real world domain is you have a, a robot within a maze and the robot it can only sense locally you know, information about walls and so on. So it doesn't have this bird's eye view that we have. And it starts here and it tries to get to this goal over there at the end. And if we have this kind of naive objective function of just getting close to the end of the maze um, as the crow flies, then what happens is this is going to instantiate a, a high scoring dead end here. Um, 
And so we would expect that if by just throwing optimization at this, we're probably just gonna hit this, this wall that the robot will learn to navigate to that, that end and just stay there. And basically that's what we find. Um, and while you might say this is kind of unfair <laughs> and it is unfair, um, that's kind of whole, the whole point. So the, the idea is this is an analogy and that we think that lots of problems actually have this structure. And it turns out that a lot of, lot of um, problems in re, re, uh, reinforcement learning in fact do have the structure of there being the, the, the skills you need to solve a, a more complex task um, often won't resemble the, um, the final behavior you, that you want. So for example, to, before you learn how to run, you have to learn how to walk or learn how to stand. And it's really hard sometimes to create a, an objective function that's going to light up all the stepping stones you actually need to get to where you want to go. Um, and so if we, oops, if we run um, kind of the, like a standard fitness function-based approach, objective-based approach, then you can see like all the search effort is going to be is going to be focused in this area right here. So these these dots are indicating just where particular policies are ending up. And even when it does find a policy that actually is along the way towards the towards reaching the goal, it has no real incentive to explore it over over the um, uh, the ones at the dead end because the score is just um, too similar. Um, but if we instead just incentivize novelty spreading out through the space, then it's these, the algorithm is able to build upon the intermediate solutions that get somewhat far through the maze to get all the way to the end. And so once again, this is kind of a toy philosophical example, but there's re research that kind of replicates this in more um, complicated domains. And in general, we might expect that as we try to build more and more complicated behaviors like, like through reinforcement learning, that you would expect it to, to run into this kind of problem. Um, so that, that was the, the algorithm I'll spend the most time on and I'll try to uh, walk through these others more quickly. I'm, I'm re realizing that that time is, is marching on us. Um, so novelty search is one way of, of kind of abstracting evolution. And there's other ways that could, that could it's accentuate different other building blocks we might care about um, in the space of open-endedness. So the, another algorithm is called minimal criteria novelty search. It takes a different view of evolution. Um, and the view of evolution that, that um, this algorithm involves is it's kind of looking at what unifies everything in biological evolution. What is the kind of, what, what's another way of looking at what evolution is doing? And there's an idea that comes from Richard Dawkins, I believe extended phenotype called the single cell bottleneck, which is that one unifying feature of all life is that it goes from one cell to one cell. That's, there's always a stage within an organism life cycle, life cycle where its contribution to the next generation is one cell. So for example, if you're a bacteria, then you go this direct path of one cell to one cell. But if you're a more complicated organism, then um, you, know, you might blossom, you might start as a single cell, like a fertilized egg and blossom to like trillions or quadrillions of cells. But again, your contribution to the next cell, next generation is again, one cell. Um, and so while it's intuitive to kind of think of elephants as, as means to get to other elephants, that an elephant is, is creating another elephant through going to the single cell bottleneck, you know, giving a, a sperm or an egg to the next um, generation. It actually is more elegant in some ways from an evolutionary point of view to look at this way, that an elephant is a cell's way of producing another cell because the cell, you know, this one copy of the genetic material is, is the only thing that's really going from generation to generation. And when you look at it this way, we can see that actually one way to view evolution is, is finding many different ways to do the same thing. Many different ways to go from one cell to one cell. And there's some direct paths like a bacteria and there are these more indirect paths like an elephant or like us. And it's a weird kind of figure ground shift where the thing that we identify intuitively is important, like what I identify is important about myself is kind of, you know, the, my ability to, to instantiate complex behaviors and so on. From an evolutionary point of view, it's almost like this odd Rube Goldbergian di digression that from its point of view, um, whether, whether we, we, you know, go to a trillion cells or would take this more direct path, doesn't really matter to evolution as long as we're going from one cell to one cell. And so it's an interesting way of, of of saying, could we have interesting search processes that just by searching for many different ways to do the same thing, that after the, the simple ways of doing this, the same thing of surviving or reproducing are kind of exhausted, that at some point the only way to really create something new is to get more complex. And so that humans live in this niche where although maybe there would be a more direct path for us to reproduce, um, 
uh, we've found this way to kind of dance to quadrillions of cells before again going this this, this simple endpoint. Um, so in nature, this minimal criteria is to survive and reproduce. But if we were if we were abstracting this into an algorithm, we could say there are many ways to do the same thing. But we could we could do that. In, we can create our, whatever minimal criteria we want in our search algorithm. So in practice, this looks like a slight variation of, of novelty search, if we wanted to, to kind of embody this as an algorithm, um, where imagine we have this, this maze, a modulation of the maze that I showed previously, um, where now we just leave, leave off some walls. Um, and now we could say, if we still measure novelty in the same way by like where the, the, the agent ends in the environment, now there's this infinite space to the, the left and to the bottom that I could kind of go within. And so, it's a, it's a little bit of an anticlimactic kind of uh, shift to the algorithm, but we could just say, hey, okay, now we'll, we only care about things that end in this interesting subset of the space. We're gonna, we're gonna call away all this infinite other stuff, and we're just gonna look for many ways to end within this square. Um, and although this is sort of a little bit anticlimactic compared to kind of the, the search for many ways to do, to do the same thing in, in biological evolution, it does turn out that this building block, even though the way we initially kind of thought about it was quite simple, uh, it does turn up in a lot of other search algorithms because just setting this floor of saying, let's look for everything that meets this minimal criteria um, can, can really be an interesting and powerful force in search. Um, okay, so the, the final in this series of, of algorithms. Um, so Nali search is about looking for diversity only. Minimal criteria search was about many ways, um, finding many different ways to do the same thing. And novelty search with local competition is about how can we how can we find diversity? How can we still care about performance, but not have the search dominated by, by just one part of, by one kind of solution? So kind of balancing between um, performance and, and diversity. Um, and one way of thinking of this from a biological point of view is kind of building on this example before of kind of there being direct and indirect ways to go from one cell to one cell if we just calculated fitness as a number, as like how efficient you were at replicating, a bacteria would, would be able to replicate in kind of hours and a bear would take years. And so if we put those head to head, then, then we would imagine the bacteria would, would, would win in that sense. And yeah, that's not what happens in biological evolution because competition isn't global. It's not that everything is competing with everything else, that bears aren't directly competing with, with bacteria, except maybe indirectly. And so what would it take to, to have a, a search process where, where competition was, was similarly local? Um, and so in this novelty search with local competition algorithm, yeah, that was the idea basically. Like we want to, we want to care about performance in, in a continuous sense, in, like, instead of like a, a hard constraint, like in, in the minimal criteria kind of formulation, we want to have a, a continuous measure of performance, but we don't want one single type of solution to dominate the space. And so example we, we work with in this paper is we optimize both the, the body, the morphology, and the control policy of a, a virtual robot. And we have a design space of robots. Um, so we, we have some kind of set of, 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 of um, some characteristics of robots we'd like to see. Like maybe we want to see tall robots and small robots, or robots that use a little bit of mass, or robots that use a lot of mass. And so we want to see all this, these kinds of solutions in this design space. And also we want to see the fastest locomoting robot in each part of that design space. So we don't want to see the, those overall single best thing, but we want to see, um, um, we want to see, whoops. We want to see the potential of all parts of this kind of morphological search space. So imagine we, had, we create this space of height, height and mass. And so we would be able to measure how novel a robot's morphology is by, by putting into this space. So that some robots will be tall and skinny, some will be big and heavy, and some will be like very worm-like and small. And we can measure the performance of these, these robots. Let's say we want to see how fast they can locomote. So we'll train all these robots to, 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 to walk fast. Um, and so now we have this measure of diversity and their morphology. We have a measure of performance and their speed. And we're just going to have them compete locally only within this space. So we're, we're going to say, you know, these robots that are tall and narrow only compete with the tall and narrow ones and so on. And, the, and what we end up with is within a single run of this process, at the end of this run, and we look at the 
population, we still have a really big diversity of, of solutions that are, that are different and different. Um, we have a collection of solutions that are very different in this space, much more so than if you actually just had everything compete with everything else, which is kind of what's typical in, in search al algorithms if you don't do something explicit like this. And so we have these, um, and so in this way, it, it you know just it, it, it resembles just a thread more um, the kind of diversity that we see in, in biology as opposed to um, what we typically see out of an algorithm that's optimizing for a single goal. Okay, so I'm, what what I've introduced introduced so far have been um, these building blocks of diversity of middle criteria of local competition kind of latent with all of these is, is kind of this building block of serendipity and that all these search algorithms um, are open to the potential of what they discover. In other words, it's not looking for a particular kind of novelty at a particular point in the search. Um, it's kind of like a subtle point, but, but some algorithms really will kind of enforce going in a particular direction. Um, and when we think about serendipity, um, we kind of understand how important it is in, in human processes of innovation that oftentimes science progresses not through like, aha, but through like, oh, that's kind of weird. What is that about? And that our ability to be receptive to, um, to signals in the environment about what's possible is really important. And we might want algorithms that similarly have that, that, that potential. Um, and I'll talk also just briefly about this, this final building block. So this is the last one. Um, which is co-evolving problems and solutions. Um, this comes from a paper by um, uh, Jonathan Brandt and Ken Stanley um, that looked at um, how to co-evolve at the same time, for example, mazes and maze solvers. And just as a simple example that you could keep generating um, new mazes, you have a search space for mazes in addition to a search space for maze solvers. And that through this process of, of co-evolution of problems and solutions, you actually can keep expanding the search and having interesting, news, interesting things to do for, for a while longer. Um, okay, so I, I'm, I'm a little bit low on time. So what I'm gonna do is, is I'm going to talk about translating these building blocks into deep learning. And then I'm going to kind of segue just to the conclusion after that. Um, so although what I've kind of talked about so far, these kind of building blocks that have been embodied in these evolutionary systems, um, the principles behind them are pretty generic. And actually you can embody them in deep learning, reinforcement learning systems um, as well. Um, so for example, the idea of serendipity in deep RL, um, there's this really beautiful paper called hindsight experience replay. Um, and the simple thing that they do in this paper is oftentimes in, in reinforcement learning, there's something particular you're looking for finding. Um, and what you can do and what they showed you can do is is, is this kind of interesting imaginary trick, which is imagine that wherever you got to, that's where you're trying to get to. So you, maybe you're trying to get to A, but you ended up at B. Now just, just pretend that your goal was B all along and use that as sort of training data um, for, for, um, for, for learning. So this is a way that um, you, know, you can deeply integrate kind of like serendipity into a, uh, into a deep RL algorithm. You talk about diversity seeking in a similar way. Um, there's a clever paper about called diversity is all you need that is, enables doing something like novelty search in the space of, um, of deep reinforcement learning policies using a, a clever trick with, with discriminators. That if you have a policy that has to maximize the entropy of the policy, it has to be as noisy as possible on the one hand, but also be have one part of the policy be, be discriminable from another. So to have a distinct, distinctly recognizable skill um, is a way that you can take that kind of building block and embody it in a different way. Or, or, or using the idea of a minimal criteria in a similar way. Um, another paper called One Solution is Not All You Need, which kind of builds on a diversity, um, the diversity is all you need kind of approach and, and kind of broadens outward into, um, and to the, the benefits of finding multiple different good enough solutions to a problem. So make, find solutions to a problem that are like basically as good as possible, but also discriminable. And that will enable you to generalize better to new kinds of um, challenges that you didn't maybe see in training. Um, and finally, um, the idea of, of using local competition um, 
with, with deep learning. So a paper that I was recently on um, used language models in this way. Um, so that um, it's this idea of like, how can we protect innovation um, using kind of a classic algorithm in this space called map elites on the left. I won't talk much about it, but the key kind of insight here was that, um, that we can use, we can sub in um, for the typical variation operator in evolution, which is often very random, which is uh, not able to learn from experience in a certain way. We can replace that with a language model. Like a language model could be a powerful um, operator of intelligent um, variation, and which is a really important um, aspect of an evolutionary algorithm. And that this model can also learn from experience as you go. And so it's a way that you can kind of um, take um, these tools that are really powerful that are being developed, um, different kinds of large models, and integrate them into an open-ended process in different ways. Okay, so I'm going to skip over over this, um, and we're just going to talk about um, kind of the open challenges. I'll try to, to talk about this quickly so there's some time for questions. Okay, so what I did was introduce all these building blocks, show that um, they're based on different kind of views of evolution, um, and that we can recombine them in different ways, and that we can um, take some of these principles and, and translate them from the evolutionary context where they were first imagined into this um, more modern machine learning, uh, deep learning language model kind of, kind of world. And at this point, um, you might already recognize this clearly, we haven't achieved our aspirations. We're, we, we're not creating open-ended algorithms that are, are kind of like blowing our, blowing our minds and kind of clearly reaching the pinnacles of biological evolution or cultural evolution. So what's missing? What's, what are the challenges, challenges that this field um, is still grappling with? Um, so one thing which is kind of immediately obvious is that the environments that we deal with in these systems are often really simple. Um, so I talked about mazes. Um, there's often these things like landscapes are evolving. Um, and even, um, even in kind of recent work from like DeepMind, there's this, this paper involving a, an environment called Xland. You have these simple games in some sense. They're 3D games, they're maybe multiplayer games. It's kind of getting more complex and you can get a lot of juice out of those things. And yet something is missing because it would, it would be hard to continue searching that space indefinitely. And that's kind of the interesting challenge here. Like if you wanted to search an algorithm that could go on meaningfully forever, what, what kind of environment actually would enable that? Um, and so it's, I think, an interesting challenge that's not really, I think, well addressed yet. Like, what, how do you construct environments with limitless potential? Um, and so, you know, one idea you might have is something maybe along the lines of it needs to be general enough to, to embody invention, that there's lots of physical machines you could make. And that's kind of an idea that we pursued um, in, in a, a paper when I was at OpenAI, but it's not clear that that is exactly the answer. And so I think there's, there's much work to be done in the realm of environmental design. And it actually could be strangely more of the bottleneck right now than the algorithmic side of things. It's, it's like, how do we actually create environments and conditions that where interesting innovation could go on forever? And you know, there's something fascinating and kind of confusing there. Um, the other main challenge for these systems is, is that when we're dealing with diversity seeking algorithms. There's something that we have to define what we mean by diversity. We have to define what we mean by what makes something different than something else. And it's a deep question. Like what makes something interesting basically is the question we're asking. We could create an open-ended system that would get lost in some nuanced eddy of, of you know, a robot that wiggles its toes in, in 10,000 different ways. And yet probably we would get bored of that. We wouldn't find that interesting from the perspective of human subjectivity. And so, uh, you know, there's, the question, it's like a philosophical question, like how can we quantify interestingness? Um, is there a theory of interestingness? And, and different people have tried, but it's a really hard problem. And maybe there's a way in which large models can help at least to push on this a little bit because they, they do start to have a little bit more conceptual understanding and it could actually potentially reason about this to some limited extent. Um, you also could imagine using things like contrastive models um, that, that kind of build up a vector space that's interesting um, to explore for some fixed period of time. But still, it doesn't quite solve things because um, that would just define a fixed space and that couldn't continue forever. Um, so we still have to grapple with this question. And so one natural kind of way out of this would be just to involve humans in the loop somehow. 
So I think an interesting research direction that hasn't been really uh, pursued much is how to merge open-endedness efficiently with human in the loop. So you can imagine trying to learn, um, trying to, to learn models of human interestingness, trying to combine open-endedness with um, one of the technologies that Carper is really interested in, um, this reinforcement learning for human feedback. Um, but I think there's, a, again, a kind of interesting philosophical, technical challenge here about how to do this well. And, and still, it, it is, it's really fascinating to me to think about what, what does interestingness mean to us and how we can make it more algorithmic. Um, so if we actually got this working, uh, I guess one thing I just want to end with is like that um, if we really created an open-ended system that was kind of continually creative, let's say in the space of neural architectures, um, yeah, then we, we run into kind of the, the edges of AI safety. Um, and I think there's interesting questions there about how do you make controllable creative systems? And it feels like there's an intrinsic tension there that doesn't apply just to these systems, but applies to, for example, human culture that, you know, we have norms around kind of what research we can talk about or not talk about and um, different companies might disagree or different parts of society might disagree about what is safe and what's not. Um, and so it seems like this is also an interesting kind of fundamental aspect of, of open-endedness. Like how do we navigate between, you know, empowering as many people to be creative as possible, but also, you know, we don't want to invent like, um, you know, the, the easy nuke, you know, like the, the, the simplest thing that if anyone had it, you know, could destroy the world with the button press. So how do we navigate that tension? It's, it's right now, I would say with open-endedness, this is not, it's not clear that we're at the precipice of this, but definitely something to kind of keep in mind and something I really think is really fascinating. Okay, so that's been kind of a whirlwind tour. I hope that uh, this was legible or, or sensible for people and I'm, I'm eager to hear questions. Um, and just to conclude, although there has been some progress, I think we are building, understanding the building blocks of open-endedness and that there's some really exciting places this, this could go. Still, there's a lot of interesting fundamental mysteries to me. and. Um, I'm, I still remain curious about what is the this abstract ens essence of continual open-ended creativity. So my uh, email and, and contact information is there. Um, and if you find this talk interesting, there's a popular science book by my longtime collaborator, Ken Stanley and I um, called Why Greatness Cannot, Cannot Be Planned that kind of packages this up um, in, a kind of a, in a pop science way with implications for society. So if you find that interesting, um, happy to hear about it. Uh, yeah, so have you take some questions. Yeah, thanks so much for the uh, for the talk, Joel. It was really good. Thank you. So let's see. Uh, if anyone has questions, you can either post in chat and I'll read them, or uh, you can unmute your mic and ask. I have a question. Um, hey, Joe. This is probably probably you get this every time. Uh, so excuse me for that. Um, uh, this is about measuring interestingness or, or or you know automating the evaluation of interestingness. And it seems to me, I don't know much about ag algorithmic information theory, but it seems like it's something kind of in the Kolmogorov complexity, AIC kind of compressibility kind of direction. Like if you get something that's suddenly not compressible. I know Stephen Wolfram also is like really into this as a way of measuring interestingness of algorithms. Um, I guess you probably tried that. It seems like it's. Yeah, there's, there's different ways that people have tried using compressibility in this way. And I think it's something that I, I wish I both understood more deeply and I have an intuition that, that there's some way that it was being applied in, in kind of an insufficient way. Um, but I think the short story was it didn't work too well in a scalable way that actually could seemingly help support this. Um, but it does seem, tantalizing or something that there, there could be something something there. Um, I, I think one interesting thing there is we care not only about kind of a compressibility and like if it becomes more compressible, but also about difference. Like what makes something interestingly different? And to me, maybe it's something to do with, with if things could be compressed in different ways, then that's interesting. So like the nature of the compression itself and maybe there's a way to, 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 to push on that. Um, but I think it's a little bit beyond my understanding of, of, of the information theory kinds of uh, frames. That's a good question. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess I have a question, which is, um, I was kind of wondering if uh, biology is actually 
like open-ended because I guess when I think of biology, I think of humans, but also of like various equilibria that were reached with like, you know, dinosaurs were kind of one equilibrium of evolution. So kind of curious to hear your thoughts on um, like if, if biology is like a, a subset of open-endedness or kind of uh, like maybe not a full example of it, I guess, uh, I'm kind of curious along those lines. Yeah. Um, I, su I suppose like we could, we could say that maybe nothing is truly open-ended in, the, the, in that, you know, the, the heat kind of death of the universe is coming and there's all, there, there are physical limitations. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a definitely a true perspective. Um, and that maybe there's always some limit to which something could be open-ended um, or not. Uh, I do think that biology, I guess one way of thinking about it is at least we have like nested layers of, of open openness. At least that's maybe how I see it. Like the, even the, the biology kind of emerged from the, some less um, directed form of open-endedness and just the unfolding of, of physical law, just like, you know, how, how planets formed, how various structures formed from, um, from, from more basic elements. And so then biology, biology kind of like, you know, started and, and definitely there could be stasis points within biology, like you're saying, like the, you know, the dinosaurs and, and the comets that disrupted that equilibrium and so on. Um, and that humans are like another layer of open-endedness that we can actually build upon the biological level and, and you know, work in the space of ideas and technologies and, and so on. Um, and there it does seem, you know, you would think maybe potentially limitless, at least the space of ideas being so broad, um, but it, it also seems like maybe that space ultimately is, is, is finite in the grand sense, but maybe there's not enough time in the universe to explore all those, those kinds of ideas. Um, yeah, I, I guess like my, this is kind of a rambling metaphysical answer, but I hope maybe that, that helps somewhat. Yeah, definitely, thanks. Hiya, um, I've got a question. Um, yeah. That's all right. Um, sure. So what role do you see um, like gradient descent or back propagation playing in these algorithms? Because um, from my understanding, you know, you could do this in a gradient free way and sort of use random perturbations to existing policies, or you could use existing RL algorithms and sort of just optimize for different reward functions like diversity. Yeah, I think that there's like this historical element where just a lot of this stuff um, came up in the evolutionary computation community, um, probably because there's such a direct analogy with, with um, biological evolution that people are fascinated with. And so there's some you know, ideologues who would, would say like, you know, it has to be evolutionary, it has to be kind of that, that way, but I, I, yeah, I'm not in that camp at all. And I do think that a really interesting and, and exciting um, thing is that with a lot of the progress in like natural language processing in particular, but just large models in general, um, you can bootstrap an open-ended search process and maybe start working on the, the more mimetic level as opposed to the genetic level. So the, yeah, the genetic level being less directed, being you know, purely random kind of mutations and so on. But when we move to this more you know, mimetic level, there could be still like, it's like, could be like an evolutionary process in some sense that, that you know, when we, we think of new ideas, but there's a strong knowledge behind that exploration that we have intuitions we develop over time. Um, and make them more concrete, um, th this kind of paper I, um, was working on an open AI called evolution through large models. It's kind of a merger of the evolution world with the great descent world in the, in the sense that like the algorithm is learning over time, how to, how to explore better. And in general, I'm pretty pro on just ways to, to benefit from, from great descent and what it's good at and how to integrate that into open-ended algorithms. I think it's probably, you know, the way things go is, is more in the great descent world and less in the evolutionary world. Thank you. Cheers. Welcome. I have another question if, if uh, we have time. Um, did you ever read Doug Hofstadter in, I think, Fluid Concepts and Creative Analogies? Uh, he made this like program that generates novel fonts and it does it in a really interesting way. Did you read that? 
yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his work. I, th- I had that book. I don't know if I have it with me anymore, but I, I bought it and I found it was really profound. And I feel like those ideas could be revisited. Um, and I, I actually, when I was at Uber, I, I, I did take, I tried to present kind of um, on that and get people excited about like, it would be cool to, to see how these connect to modern machine learning methods. Uh, but yeah, it was really fascinating the way that it builds from the bottom up um, kind of like connections between the ideas. And there's like these flexible search processes, the idea of a parallel terrorist search or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I, really, I really found it quite fascinating. And I think he has some really interesting ideas and it's interesting the way that he's stayed kind of, kind of um, uh, in his own world, you know, not, you know, not really been perturbed by all the stuff going on machine learning, but yeah, some really powerful, interesting ideas. I feel like there could be a synthesis there. Brian Christian was talking with uh, Melanie Mitchell, who is one of Hofstadter's grad students, uh, about this stuff recently. So maybe the three of us can somehow loop up, or the four of us. <laughs> yeah, it'd be, um, it'd be fun. Yeah. Uh, but but one of the things that I really liked about the font thing was that it it developed a bag of motifs that it could apply to a given font. Um, so it'd be like, oh, I can italicize it. Oh, I can. I can thicken it or whatever. And it discovered these things. And he actually made it, it would kind of work. And it discovered novel dimensions in which it could elaborate a font. So it kind of had, it was in a way like your problem solution thing, but um, instead of being problems, it was like a kind of a bag of tricks that it could apply to. Um, yeah, and it seems like that that might be another place for novelty search. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Like the, the way that his systems were designed, there's, you know, very, it was kind of like, it had to be constructed for each domain or something. Like there's these kind of word jumbled domains. There's kind of like, I remember it was like, like setting the table domain and, and you know, there's all these sorts of little micro worlds, which were really cool. And yeah, the question to me is like, how, how could those same ideas, yeah, be made in a, in a maybe more domain agnostic kind of way, more, and I guess in some ways I'm surprised that that hasn't happened yet because like, it does feel like a lot of people are interested in his ideas and a lot of people are interested in kind of the uh, the the, you know, the direction of machine learning are going right now but for whatever reason that hasn't come together maybe it's hard to do maybe it's not not easy or maybe it's impossible to do or maybe it um, just needs more time yeah Joel if you have time for one more question um, I was curious about the example that you gave um, of bacteria and bears and the, the speed at which they uh, can like propagate themselves. It seems to me like simpler stuff, bacteria, um, it's gonna be easier to simulate in practice. And so there might be, it seems like there might be a, a bias in uh, open-ended research towards stuff that's in question on a small scale. But I wonder if there, do you think there might be um, kinds of interestingness that can only show up if you've got sufficient complexity and then whether that might be difficult to achieve in, in practice and research because you have limited resources and you're looking for the flashiest thing you can get with a, a certain compute budget. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting question because it it kind of like tears me in some ways because like um, it's there's almost something sad in just how you know more is different and so the scale does matter and so some things will only show up on that larger scale, um, or it might only show up on that larger scale. And it, it's hard to do research there. Like if you really wanna to go to, to, to the grandest scale you can right now, then you know, there's only a limited number of places you can do that. Um, and it's just more painful. You know, it's just more, more infrastructure, more um, complexity. And I, I, do, I do find myself sometimes drawn towards the philosophical thought experiments, like the, the novelty search with the you know, robot in the maze. Um, certainly that's a very simple scenario and one that's not going to um, enable, you know, a whole bunch of like incredible emergent complexity. <clears throat> so I do think that that's a lesson that seems to be showing up a lot more is different. Um, and yeah, it's interesting to think about how in particular that ties to open-endedness and if there's a way to, to, to show how more is different. Um, so maybe some interesting possibility for work there. Hello. Hello. So let's uh, let's make this the uh, the last question, so we don't we don't keep uh, Joel for for hours. 
Sure, can I ask, can I, uh, Mark? Yeah, yeah. Ask away. Yeah. So I was a part of an organization that uh, was started by uh, an AI pioneer and a pioneer in education. And uh, in that org, I built environments that uh, taught kids to learn on their own. So I'm sure that we can bridge some gaps between uh, these two environment building uh, methodologies. I'm happy to uh, contribute here and de anonymize myself eventually. Yeah, it sounds interesting. I mean, like, um, I, it'd be awesome if there were lots of you know, pro-social applications of open-endedness and education does seem like an open-ended sort of space. Um, so yeah, I'd be curious to talk more. Sounds interesting. Definitely, awesome. All right, well, thank you for all the questions, Joel. Thank you for the talk again. Um, yeah, so if uh, anyone has further questions, feel free to ask in the, uh, the Discord and this talk will be recorded and uploaded in a few hours probably. All right. Have a good day, everyone. It was great to be here. Thanks for 